Hello, thank you for attending our webinar. This webinar is designed to specifically unpack the OSHA emergency temporary standards. We know the litigation landscape is changing daily and that you likely have a lot of questions about the legal activity and how it impacts employer deadlines and obligations. We will address many of your questions on today's webinar, but also join us tomorrow on our LinkedIn Live event where we will continue the conversation and take more questions about the ETS litigation and the status of employers' obligations. Thank you for joining. Good afternoon. Welcome today's, to today's webinar, COVID vaccine and the OSHA emergency temporary standards. In this webinar, we are going to be discussing the private employer OSHA emergency temporary standards. We know that you have a lot of questions about many of the other mandates out there, including the CMS and the healthcare emergency temporary standards. Folks with those questions can reach out to Marty Heller separate from this program or to the Hub Risk Management Healthcare Practice Team, and they'll be happy to help you navigate some of those healthcare mandatory obligations. Today's program, like I said, will cover the private employer emergency temporary standards that's applicable to private employers with 100 or more employees. Thank you so much for attending today. We really appreciate you setting the time aside for us. Couple of housekeeping items before we get going. We are recording this webinar. There will be a link sent to everyone who registered for this program after the airing of the program. Included in that link will be some additional materials and opportunities to get the presentation. You can submit questions during our presentation and we will do our very best to cover them in the Q&A at the end of the program. We will also be covering questions in our very cool live LinkedIn event on Friday, November 19th at 12 p.m. Central. So we're gonna put the band back together on LinkedIn. Please join us, bring your questions with you. We're happy to take them live, put us on the spot. Now, Marty and I are both attorneys, everybody knows that, but this is not legal advice, this is an education program, so take it in that context. And finally, after the webinar, you will get a um, survey. Please answer those questions. Those questions really matter to us, your answers matter to us, and they will guide our future programming. All right, let's get going. My name is Carrie Shreveni. I am the Chief Compliance Officer for Hub South. Marty, will you introduce yourself? Sure, I am Marty Heller. I am a partner with Fisher Phillips, a uh, labor and employment law firm providing services on the management side uh, nationwide. Cool. Marty, thanks for joining me today. I always have fun presenting with you. You as well. All right, guys, so we got two things to cover, but they're both big, so don't let this agenda fool you. Um, we're gonna cover the emergency temporary standard just issued by OSHA. And we are going to go into the reasonable accommodation and undue hardship process. So we know you have a lot of questions about how that works as well. So let's jump right in. Marty, will you lead us out of the gate? Absolutely. So let's go back about a little more than two months ago, uh, September 9th, uh, President Biden uh, released several different uh, executive orders letting us know his path out of the pandemic plan. So this was part of a six-pronged strategy that included, first, several different mandates that employees get vaccined, uh, vaccine, vaccinated. Uh, so the, one of the mandates was intended to apply to those who receive Medicare or Medicaid. Uh, and as Carrie mentioned earlier, we're not gonna cover the CMS mandate today. Uh, but that is one of the mandates. Another of the mandates uh, is applicable to federal contractors. Now that wasn't part of the path out of the pandemic plan. It actually had been released before then, uh, but we got regulations on what it means for federal contractors to have mandatory vaccination policies, who it applies to, who it doesn't apply to, when and why uh, around the same time frame. Um, and then we got you know, what you see in the middle of this slide, which is really the, the most important part for today's presentation, the mandatory vaccination or testing component for employers that have 100 or more employees. Um, we knew at the time, this is back on September 9th, we knew at that time 
that it would require paid time off to get vaccinated. We didn't know a lot of other things that we now know as of just a few weeks ago. So we have brand new information to share on what this requires and what it means that we'll go through uh, in our slides today. So this mandatory vaccination or testing requirement uh, for employers with 100 or more employees takes the form of an ETS, what's known as an emergency temporary standard. So this vehicle for this requirement isn't new. Been around for years, and OSHA has tried and done this before, sometimes with success, sometimes without success. Um, and so whether or not this is a permissible emergency temporary standard is yet to be seen. But our clients and our anybody attending this webinar today needs to understand that because it remains to be seen, we have to assume that this is going to be in place. Um, certainly being caught off guard on these applicable dates we'll tell you about could lead to very substantial uh, fines in the event that you do not have the required policies and procedures in place. Um, go back uh, one slide real quick, Terry. Um, so what is an emergency temporary standard? It is the government saying, there's a grave danger. There's something very significant that has happened um, that we have to protect against. So that's where you will see the lawsuits. The one thing to keep in mind is uh, these citations are going to be deemed serious. And so that's 14,000 is actually a roundup of the serious citation number that's 13,000 and change. Um, but keep in mind that is likely to be per person uh, violation. All right, so the ETS itself, which was released uh, on November 4th, published on November 5th. Um, first and foremost, they kept this 100 employee threshold in. So we have 100 or more employees means that you are covered by this mandate. Um, what do you have to do? Well, you have to develop, implement, and enforce either a mandatory COVID-19 vaccination policy, or you have to do that and adopt a policy that says if you are unwilling to get vaccinated, you have to undergo COVID-19 testing weekly and agree to wear a mask while at work. The way an emergency temporary standard works, it goes into place and is effective immediately. That's the nature of this grave danger. However, there's a 30-day period of non-enforcement so that employers have the reasonable opportunity to come up to speed with these new regulations. Key dates to remember. We have this 11-5 date of when it was published in the Federal Register, which means December 5th, many of the requirements become effective. January 4th is the deadline for the testing or vaccination requirement. So the policies, the procedures, the reviewing of roster and creating of rosters, the maintaining of documents, we're gonna see that come into effect in December. And then later on, we will see this um, uh, testing or vaccination requirement. So what does that mean? What are we, what are we talking about uh, for December 5th, Gary? So you got it, Marty. December 5th is really the really big deadline. And I think a lot of the, um, there's been a lot of misreporting about these deadlines. And so I really need employers to pay attention here. The big heavy lifting is actually December 5th, not January. Um, in December, you have to have your vaccine tracking and protocol in place, including obtaining records, obtaining confirmation of who's vaccinated, obtaining the proof, having the status, getting your data organized, having your technology organized, be ready to report, um, have a policy in place. This policy is no joke. There's a lot of com complicated components to the policy itself. I know that Fisher Phillips has an awesome toolkit. You can reach out to Marty and he'll tell you what their process and policy is to get their toolkit, but it's well worth the effort. Um, we've published an ebook that covers some of the components, but not nearly as robust as Fisher Phillips has. OSHA has a sample vaccine policy that you can pull down, but the policy's got a lot of moving parts to it. 
Um, you also have to be prepared to provide the time off, both time off to become vaccinated, which is a four hour requirement, and separately, time off, reasonable time, for employees who suffer or experience adverse side effects from receiving each dose of the vaccine if they do the two dose program or side effects from the single dose program through J&J. &J. Either way, reasonable on the eyes of OSHA is about two days, um, but this is separate time off that has to be provided for those side effects. Any employee who's not fully vaccinated by December 5th must be wearing face coverings. Um, and like I said, you've got to be ready for the reporting requirements, which means your technology, technology data and tracking has to be available and be ready to provide copies of documentation. In January, you must be ready to test, meaning anybody who is unvaccinated will have to start providing their test results to the organization. Again, you've got to have that technology in place to handle the testing. We're going to talk about the testing requirements in more detail deeper into the program. So one of the big questions I've been getting, and Marty, I'm guessing you're getting as well, and I'm gonna ask for your input on some of this, is the headcount. Well, some of the rules around headcount I think are pretty clear and pretty easy. Um, the headcount occurs at the employer level. It is not location specific. One of the more common questions we get is, well, I've got 50 employees in one location and 30 in another and another 50 somewhere else. You've got to aggregate all those employees. It doesn't matter how many employees you have at each location. Good news, we didn't anticipate this, or I certainly didn't anticipate this good news. Staffing agencies, jointly employed, co-employed employees are not aggregated and independent contractors are not included. But Marty, I'll tell you, one of the questions I'm getting a lot is which ownership interest counts or is it all ownership interests? For example, control group status versus common ownership versus the integrated employer test. There's so many different ways to determine aggregated employer ownership. What direction do you think employers should take? I think you have to assume that uh, whichever entity is reviewing this at the time, which, you know, whether it's an OSHA investigation, or someone else reviewing it um, while maintaining the fact that, you know, for example, wage and hour may come in um, and then refer this to OSHA. I think you have to assume they're going to use the most favorable to the employee joint employer test. So even though we have this wonderful statement in the rules that staffing agencies are responsible for their own employees, I think that's really the only exception where I'm comfortable telling any of my clients you don't have to worry about any joint employment issue. Um, and even then, if you are taking overt control and the staffing agency is maybe uh, subsumed within your organization, uh, which I've seen a few of those, uh, I think you have a significant issue there as well. Uh, I think you have to assume that the likelihood of finding joint employment and considering the employees yours, if you're thinking about it and you're questioning it, I think that's probably the answer that you have to follow. If you ask the question it, because you are concerned, count them. It's better to be safe and count them than it is to exclude them, find out you were covered, and then have someone saying you have 112 violations. And Marty, is it fair to say that when you're considering the belly buttons to count, that you would count all W-2 belly buttons in the organization? Is that a, regardless of their status, full-time, part-time, seasonal, intern, that sort of thing? Yep, absolutely. And e even further than that, and this was a question we had come up the other day, what if you're at 95 employees right now and you're seasonal and you're adding more employees in a few months? Well, if you get to the point where you trigger this at any point, you remain covered. So you have to take the position that if it's down the road or if it's now, and then you have a drop off, you remain covered and you need to take uh, compliance steps to make sure you are following the requirements. And what about the reverse? Let's say I go into this thing with 110 employees, Christmas is over, I lay off 30, do I still have to follow? Yeah, I think you stay covered under it. Um, it's not entirely clear, but the preamble seems to indicate so. 
Yeah, I read it the same way. Cool. So who's excluded? So what we're talking about here is who is excluded from some of the requirements, not who is excluded from the 100 employee count. Um, so first, and this is helpful because uh, there are some competing obligations between the federal contractor, the requir requirement, the CMS requirement, and this ETS. You essentially are covered by the most onerous one, and you don't have to then therefore follow all of the ETS if you're covered by the CMS. So follow the one that you're covered by. More onerous, of course, would be the CMS and the federal contractor. Why? Because this is a get vaccinated or get tested, and those are get vaccinated, no alternative. So those take precedence over this ETS. However, assuming you're not covered by either of them, but you are covered by the 100 or more uh, employee threshold, we now have to look and say, okay, who else is potentially having an exclusion? And we're going to look and say um, there are employees who work entirely remotely. Um, now, when we say entirely remotely, we mean they don't set foot in the office. If they set foot in the office, the law says that you have to test them within seven days before they enter the office but you don't have to count them. Uh, they don't have to go towards, sorry, not count them. They don't go towards your uh, testing requirements while they're staying at home. This ETS only lasts six months. So to the extent we're looking at a six month ETS, if you have remote only employees, it's obviously good advice to keep them that way during this period. Also, there is in theory, an exception for workers who work entirely outside. I want people to be careful about this for a couple different reasons. If they come inside to clock in and clock out and to eat, I think you lose this exception. Second of all, if they ride together to the place where they are working outside and they have met at an employer's place of business or at a location that was organized by the employer, I think they lose that exception. So it's something that I think in theory might cover a lot of construction and agricultural workers, but keep in mind, there's a lot of exceptions to that exception, if you will. Um, and so it may actually be pretty difficult to meet that. Uh, the employee still counts, like I said, for purposes of that 100 employee count. You just don't have to test or, vac uh, or inquire as to mandatory vaccination or testing there. And Marty, before we started the program, you and I had a great conversation about the reporting of those 100% remote workers or outside workers. Do you want to clarify that for the audience too? Because I think it is a point of confusion. Yeah, I, so it's my reading of the preamble and the regulations that the roster and the inquiry requirements, meaning find out whether they're vaccinated or not, and maintain that information on a roster along with the data and documents. It's my reading that you have to still do that for those individuals because in the event they do either begin working inside or uh, come to a workplace uh, at a time uh, when you have to have them tested at least a week before they enter the workplace, you need to have that information. So I think they're subject to the documentation requirements, I think you still should be training them as well. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. All right, so we've got these notice requirements. Um, and this is essentially what do we have to be telling employees? What is it that the emergency temporary standard is going to require us to communicate to employees in order for them to uh, satisfy their obligations required by this? Uh, six month rule. Uh, first of all, that essentially, if you want to boil it down, they need to know everything that you're required to do. They need to have the policies and procedures that you are being forced to implement. They have to get a copy of them. Uh, that's kind of common sense, but of course, we want to see signed acknowledgments or electronic acknowledgments saying they've seen them. The CDC created a, a document especially uh, about vaccines. The entire purpose of the document is to educate employees um, so that they might choose to get vaccinated. 
uh, this document per the ETS must be uh, provided to employees. We also, of course, have to tell them in several different ways that they are protected from retaliation, both under the uh, under OSHA and under this regulation itself. Um, we have to let them know there are criminal criminal penalties for providing false information. Of course, why is that? Because we don't want employees saying they're vaccinated, providing false um, documentation of vaccination when they're not. Um, and then, of course, that there are criminal penalties for providing false documentation. All right, so the policy itself. Here is what is required. Um, first, which step are you taking? Is it mandatory vaccination or is it a mandate or test policy? We have to have that in the policy. Of course, we can't straddle the fence. We have to pick a side. Um, what process are we going to use to determine the vaccination status? Uh, that's something laid out by the regs and Carrie's gonna tell us a little bit more about that in just a minute. Uh, the time uh, and pay or leave that they're entitled to. So the law specifically says that they are entitled to paid time off for this, um, up to four hours. Of course, if it takes less, you only pay them how long it takes. But it may be a better policy to just pay them for four hours uh, for each shot. Uh, it's a lot better than saying, I paid you two hours. Even though I know you were gone for three or four, I still only paid you two because that's what we assumed it would take. Um, they are entitled to paid time off for the side effects um, that they have as a result of getting uh, vaccinated. Um, there are procedures they have to follow, of course, if they have a positive COVID-19 test. This isn't new procedures. This is following the CDC guidelines, um, but we have to tell them about this in the policy. And then the procedures that we're going to be using, both to maintain records and then to produce requested records. For example, an employee has a right to request uh, information about the total number of employees and the number of employees that are vaccinated. Um, and we have to provide that to them within 24 hours. So there's these little intricate details that we need to be putting into the policy. Um, we also have to give information about uh, testing and face covering requirements for those who are not vaccinated. All right, so what do you do now? What's the first step? Well, we can't do any of this. We can't implement any part of this ETS unless we know who's vaccinated and who isn't. Now, if we already did this, here's another concession that the preamble gave to employers. If you already did a survey on vaccination status, but you did not collect data and documents in the way mandated by the ETS, you can rely upon your previous roster, but moving forward, we have to maintain the data and documentation. So if you haven't already done this, or if maybe we did it, but it wasn't really that formal and we're not really that confident about the results, we want to do a survey of employees so that we can find out who is and who is not vaccinated. Then we've got to determine, are we going to have a mandate, mandatory vaccine policy, or are we going to have a, a vaccine or test policy? We're gonna figure out how we're going to collect and track results. And we're gonna figure out um, from the OSHA perspective, and this is just not a figure out, but more of a little bit of background. From the OSHA perspective, it might be burdensome. And in fact, I can tell you it's going to be burdensome to track these records on testing weekly. So if you want to do a mandatory vaccination policy, like we've seen in the media that's been done by a lot of large employers already, OSHA says we'll sign off on that, that that's permissible. So when you start tracking and collecting vaccine records, the regs are very clear about what's acceptable. Certainly the CDC card, um, a record of immunization from a healthcare provider or from a pharmacy, copies of medical records. So if some reason you don't have your CDC card, you can get your medical records from your healthcare provider. Um, immunization records, if you went through a state or local or county um, facility, you can get the records from any one of those locations. Any other official documentation that identifies the vaccine type, the date, the healthcare professional, and the clinic that administered the vaccine. 
Guys, those dates are really important. A general statement of being vaccinated is not enough. You need the vaccination type and you need those dates because eventually, while boosters are not included right now, we anticipate that boosters may be eventually folded into that definition of fully vaccinated. The other obligation that you have is to be sure that individuals are getting their first and second dose timely and tracking that two week period after the second dose or the one dose of J&J &J, um, to reach that fully vaccinated status. There's no like half vaccinated here in the eyes of the ETS, either you are fully vaccinated or you are not. If you have one shot of the two, you are not fully vaccinated. If you have both shots or you got your single J&J &J shot, but you're not two weeks out, you're not fully vaccinated. And up until the point you reach full vaccination, the employee is subject to the testing and the face covering policy. So as you track these records, it's important that you have the dates and the detail. Now, in the event that the employee really for real can't get their hands on any proof of vaccination, which I find hard to believe because I know personally, my records were uploaded into Walmart and Walmart has a big tracking system and I can call them anytime and get copies of my vaccine documents, but that's just me. Um, employees can complete an attestation, but this is where that fact sheet from OSHA on criminal penalties for false information becomes really important. The criminal penalties are real. So if an employee provides false information, they can be fined by the federal government and they could even potentially face jail time. So the CDC, OSHA, they're taking this really seriously and that fact sheet is intended to inform employees of what happens if they decide this is time to submit a fake COVID card or lie in their attestation about their vaccine status. Yeah, and one, one thing that came up fairly recently on that attestation was the first legitimate explanation I've heard of when it might be appropriate mm -hmm. um, was people who received the vaccine in another country. So there have been uh, vaccine clinics set up in other countries where you simply wait in a line, you receive the vaccine, but they don't have the medical records uh, in the same format that we would expect to have in the U.S. And that, I think, is a good example of when the attestation may be appropriate, uh, but it's certainly not Joe showing up and saying, I swear I did it. That is such a great example. I hadn't even thought of that. Thank you, Marty. Um, I also want to make really clear as you were talking, something dawned on me. I, I am getting a lot of questions and you're probably getting them as well around antibodies. Well, what if I can prove that I have the antibodies? Um, antibody tests not only are not sufficient to prove that you're vaccinated, but in fact, the EEOC is really clear that employers are not permitted to ask for antibody tests. So the antibody conversation shouldn't even be happening in the workplace with employers. Yep, totally agree. All right, let's talk about testing and Marty and I are, are gonna tackle this one together. Um, from the testing standpoint, I'm getting a lot of questions around what kind of tests are acceptable, how do I do this, how do I track it? So let's start with some foundational information. Any test that has emergency use authorization and approved by the FDA and testing approved by the FDA is acceptable. That does include the home rapid test that you can buy at any drugstore, et cetera. Um, there are some rules around using those home tests. We're gonna talk about that. The testing has to be performed every seven days and the documentation of the test result has to be provided to the employer every seven days. How you schedule and how you manage that seven days I think is gonna be highly dependent on the employee's work schedule. If you've got employees coming in every week, I think you'll be able to get into more of a cycle than employees who have hybrid arrangements or random work days or random times when they come into the office. Here's the important point about these home-based rapid tests. They cannot be both self-administered and self-reported. Well, Carrie, what am I gonna do? I'm not gonna have somebody go to my employee's house and watch them stand in their kitchen and swab themselves, no, but, they can be proctored. And I've been telling people, we have a great habit in this country of taking really simple concepts and giving them 
big complicated sounding labels. Proctoring really means a FaceTime phone call with a healthcare professional or somebody who's trained to observe an employee conduct the test themselves. A lot of companies out there are offering both proctoring services, test supply services, and test data tracking and process management. There's all kinds of vendors out there that are offering all kinds of services in different size and shapes um, and, and, and methodologies. Um, employees can buy the test themselves. Some employers may want to absorb the cost. Marty's gonna talk about the cost of testing in a minute and ship the test to the employees' homes. But the good news here is that the over-the-counter rapid tests will suffice, but they cannot be self-administered and self-reported. Another option besides a FaceTime call and having somebody actually watch the employee at home perform the test and take a picture and upload those results is the employee can do the testing in the office and you can appoint somebody in the company to be the observer of the employee conducting the test themselves. Most of you will think that I'm crazy that I'm even going to make the following point, but I do have some clients who may want to do this. Employers should not be administering the test for the employee unless they are CLIA certified or obtain a specific CLIA waiver. What's CLIA? CLIA is a specific certification and licensing for laboratories. And unless you're that, you should not be administering these tests. The person appointed for the employer to proctor or observe the employee doing the test will do just that. They will stand there and observe the employee conduct the test him or herself. Um, Marty, you want to talk for a minute about the cost of testing? Sure. So the emergency temporary standard uh, says on its face, there's no requirement for employers to pay for the testing. Whether that now, they then maybe one sentence later, uh, say under OSHA and say nothing, of course, about the Fair Labor Standards Act. So whether that is actually uh, an acceptable rule or not is an open area. So we have a couple places we wanna consider that. One is for exempt employees and one is for non-exempt employees. So for your exempt employees, your properly salaried workers who are not entitled to uh, overtime or minimum wage protections uh, based on whatever their exempt status is under the FLSA. I'm not particularly concerned that making them pay for the test is going to somehow lose the exemption or create an improper deduction. I think that's that's a pretty far-fetched argument, and I think there's a fair defense to that. Now, for your hourly paid workers, you know, keep in mind the FLSA provides for only two things as a protection other than retaliation protections: minimum wage, overtime. So, if this uh, cost of this test is going to take them below minimum wage. So if you have workers that you're paying, I don't know, $7.50 an hour, and the cost of the test each week is going to take them down below that, I think you have some concern enough to, to say, I'd rather play it safe. Um, it's not, you know, from my perspective, can I, can I make a very reasonable legal argument that it is not uh, an improper uh, deduction that would take them below minimum wage? Sure, I can make that argument. But do I want to be in a position that I have to? And the answer to that is, if I'm talking to my client, I don't want to have to be in that position because I do not want them to be subjected to potentially uh, accidentally creating a minimum wage violation. One of the easy answers to that is providing a vendor to do on-site testing. Um, and they pay for, you know, pay for the time and pay for the test. Now, what the rule is silent about is the time that it takes to get tested and who pays for that time. I think you have to take the safe approach and assume that it's compensable time. Great. Thank you, Marty. And then folks who have had COVID, so we, we're gonna talk through the COVID positive protocol, but if you have employees who have had COVID, they do not have to go through this regular weekly testing if they're unvaccinated for 90 days because there are high chances of false positives with folks who have recently had COVID or at least within 90 days of having COVID. 
and and talk about a really neat um, uh, unexpected nice benefit for employers there that's half the life of the ETS and actually more than that because uh, the testing requirement doesn't come into place until January 4th so there's only four months left of an ETS at that point and 90 days of it you don't have to test the person so who knew the silver lining was the people that get COVID? Um, but that is that is one of the ways that create a pretty substantial relief from this. And so if you have remote workers who are 100% remote, who unfortunately get COVID, they can come back into the workplace and not have to deal with the testing and the mask, do they, they do have to do the masking though, is that right? Because they're unvaccinated, it's just the testing, but they still have to wear the mask. Right. Yeah, okay. what a fascinating sequence of events that we might have the people who got it that were remote workers eat more easily returning to the workplace. Who would have thunk that? But you know, it is COVID <laughs> world, so nothing, everything's upside down. Um, and then lastly, guys, um, for folks who become ill with COVID, FFCRA is long, long over, long, long past, and there is no requirement for you to provide wage replacement benefits to people who have to go home because they have a COVID positive test or become sick with COVID. They can use your regular sick PTO vacation policy. All right, so what do you do now? Um, it's time to have a plan, have a plan in place for collecting and tracking the test results. Who's collecting those test results? Um, when are the test results going to be collected? How will you track them? And remember, very importantly, anybody involved in this process, anybody getting their hands on test results, COVID positive information, vaccine related information, all the documentation associated with the ETS, vaccines and tests, is confidential medical information under the ADA. It is not HIPAA unless you are the healthcare provider and then you should be on the CMS webinar with our healthcare folks in December. Um, but it is absolutely confidential information under the ADA and it should be kept as such. And the people involved in this process have to be trained. I can't tell you, and Marty, you've probably seen it too, how many conversations I've had with clients and coworkers and prospects and lunches and dinners, and people are freely discussing other people's, their employees, COVID status and vaccine status, and that's just not the right thing to do. It's all highly confidential information. Identify your vendors, identify your technology. If you're a hub client, we do have some relationships and we are making introductions to help our clients find the right technology for vaccine tracking, reporta, reporting the rosters and test results and all of that reporting as well. So Marty, will you talk for a few minutes about the time associated with getting vaccinated? I know we've hit on this a couple of times, but can we really unpack it now? Yeah, so and it's, it's a really interesting part of the, both the preamble and the regulation itself on the ETS is how they came up with sort of the, the two different levels, they start with this assumption that A, you have to pay for, to be vaccinated, uh, for someone to get vaccinated, B, you cannot deduct from their currently existing PTO. So we, we can't say, well, you've got 10 hours left of PTO, now we're gonna make it eight, because uh, that's how long we think it's gonna take. We, we can give them additional paid time off, but we cannot deduct from something they've already earned and then they say, well, it's going to be 55 minutes. And of course, I'm curious, how did you get to the 55 minutes? So I, I, I can't stop reading this thing. Uh, Carrie and I both were emailing back and forth the day it came out. 470 pages. And of course, you know, you have to be the first to read it. You got to sit there at 8 a.m. You're you know, spending three, four hours reading this thing. Um, and their explanation of the 55 minutes is fascinating. Uh, it's that it takes 15 minutes to get to your average medical care provider, it takes five minutes to complete the paperwork, then they're assuming that it's 15 more minutes home, so there's 35 minutes of the time, and then they're assuming you get called back into the doctor's office, 
let's just say you're going to the doctor's office to get your vaccine, you get the shot and then you leave within that extra 20 minutes. Now, they clearly don't live in Atlanta, I'll say that, um, because I can't get anywhere in 15 minutes, uh, let alone have the luck of have it happen twice. Um, on top of that, uh, I don't, even with the vaccine clinics, I've not seen a whole lot of people that are in and out of there as quickly as what OSHA assumed. Now, that's why they gave this upper end, which is the four hour estimate. And that's why when we were talking earlier, I said, well, you know, don't assume that it's going to be something less. This 55 minute assumption, I think, is flawed. So if we say, let's throw that out the window, let's not use that. It, we can either say, hey, why don't you tell me and report to me exactly how long it took you to get the vaccine? Or we can pay the higher end. Now, I'm going to give you a, a piece of warning. So paying the higher end sounds nice. Um, and I say that because it creates consistency and you don't have all of the moving parts of getting things wrong. But what if, and Carrie, I'm curious if you agree with me on this, um, but what if you have an employee who for some reason has a situation where it takes them five hours to get the vaccine? Something unusual happens. Um, and let's not call it a side effect because we know if it's a side effect, you have to pay for that. My personal belief is the assumption of a four-hour max is from OSHA's perspective, but the FLSA would tell you, you have to pay for it because you're mandating it. Mm -hmm. And therefore, because it's for the benefit of the employer to comply with the OSHA policy and requirements, I think you'd have to pay more. So I think your policies on this need to say, we're going to pay you for four hours or whatever you're assuming you're going to pay them for it. But if it takes longer, you need to report it to us so that we know. And I think the safest position to take is to pay even more than four hours. I will say, I think that's going to be very few and far between. Uh, but I had that question come up the other day. I agree a thousand percent. So then here's the other wrinkle as the employment lawyers on the webinar start to geek out. Um, stick with us, audience. We, this will be helpful. Um, what about <laughs> overtime? So I normally work a 38 hour week, but I live in Atlanta and Marty was right. It took me an hour to get each way. Plus there's such a line for people to get vaccinated. This was a six hour endeavor. So now I have four hours of overtime. Am I paying overtime? So it's a good question that isn't answered. Um, so we're guessing right now. And of course I'm going to use a word we've all overused in the last two hours. It's unprecedented. We have not had to really deal with this before. Uh, here's, here's what I would say is my perspective. I think that when I initially saw the executive order use the words paid time off has to be provided, I thought, okay, that's not work. They're expressly acknowledging that all you have to do is offer PTO. However, as I read the preamble and the regulation mm -hmm. itself, as it came out after the executive order, I think they muddied that water a good bit. So I am a better safe than sorry practitioner. My personal opinion is arguments aside, be safe, count it as time works. And if, you know, if they're going outside of the workday, if it's during the workday, it's just part of their normal work hours. But if it's outside of the workday and it causes, let's say they left at four o'clock, and they didn't finish until seven o'clock and that caused them to go to 42 hours or 43 hours. I think you consider it overtime and you pay overtime. I agree 100%. If for no other reason, by the time you're done defending yourself, you would have spent more money on the two or th on defending yourself than you would have for the couple of hours of overtime. I agree 100%. Yeah, absolutely. Um, same on the testing side. So we talked about this a little bit earlier, but OSHA says, oh, you know, testing is free. Uh, we've already warned about the testing being free, but I think the time to be tested, sure, it might be de minimis, but I think it's something we have to come up with a reasonable assumption. Tell them to go through the CVS line. CVS line test takes 15 minutes, uh, even when there's a line. Uh, and so you, you make that assumption and tell them if it takes longer, you need to tell us. And if you're doing the at-home proctored testing, 
um, arguably in that case, it's certainly, you know, 10, 15 minutes, not, not something that's too onerous. I think the buy next now test is 15 minutes. All right, so a little bit more detail on the face covering requirements because, of course, we can't get through 470 pages without OSHA telling us rules on everything. So what do they mean by face covering? When? Um, so it's when you're indoors. They tried to say you don't have to wear it when you're in an office, but they didn't say an office. They like to give us very specific definitions with floor-to-ceiling walls. So uh, floor-to-ceiling walls that cover all sides with a door that closes. So it seems pretty clear to me they mean if you're in your own office. Um, also, for a limited time, of course, pulling up, taking down to eat or drink or for identification purposes. Um, yes, we all have our waters as we sit here. Um, uh, think of, you know, going through a security line where they need to compare your face to an ID, you know, going through at the airport. That's what they mean by this. Um, when it's infeasible, uh, when you have to see their mouth for, to perform their job, I don't know that I can think of a great example of this. I guess if um, reading lips somehow is an integral part of the job, uh, perhaps. Uh, if you want to fall within that exception, I'd say call your lawyer, call, call your, <laughs> call Carrie, call one of us. Call oh, Marty. Be careful. <laughs> <laughs> that one's messy. Um, and then creating a greater hazard. That's another one where it's going to be very few and far between. The one thing OSHA said in this ETS that is interesting and something a little bit different than what we've been advising on before is essentially if an employee wants to wear an N95, you let them wear an N95, even in, instead of the face covering. But what's interesting is OSHA is really careful to incorporate and cross-refer to the mini respirator program. So if you're allowing your employees to wear respirators in lieu of masks, there is specific OSHA regulations and training that's required and proper, you know, application and wearing and donning and doffing and all that fun OSHA mask stuff. Yeah. Yes. They have to be fitted for that mask. They have to be trained on the proper use of that mask. I would not be allowed to wear one. You cannot have facial hair and be properly fitted for an N95. So there's a whole lot that goes into that. This is, it's what's interesting about it is that OSHA says we well, have to allow them to wear it if they want to, but that also means that you have to put in place a new policy. All right. Um, all right. So. You know, a lot of our slides are focused on what we'd like to help you with doing right now. One part of this is developing a plan to handle accommodation requests. Carrie and I had some really interesting back and forth in prepping for this about some of the language in OSHA's um, ETS that talks about accommodations as if uh, it's only for uh, mandatory vaccine policies. And of course, this isn't the CMS policy. This isn't the federal contractor policy. So in theory, and I know Carrie's gonna talk more about this in a minute, but in theory, I guess it's from the testing and uh, mask wearing component, uh, but we wanna make sure we have a plan for handling accommodation requests. We're gonna get them. We wanna engage in the interactive process. By the way, this isn't a new process. You should already have this in place. You're dealing with ADA requests for accommodation all the time. You're probably not regularly dealing with religious accommodation requests. Um, at least most employers aren't commonly dealing with that, but now it's a new thing. We have to, it's always been there, just isn't common that somebody walks in and says, I can't lift more than 10 pounds because of my religion. Of course, they say that because I need an accommodation for my back issue. Um, but now there is a uh, religious-based uh, request that we're receiving. So make sure you have policies on these um, and understand them. And then preparing for OSHA complaints and inspections and citations. There's a couple things I want you guys to know um, that I thought were really interesting. One is for anybody who's had OSHA show up on your doorstep, they like to ask for your 300A logs and you have to give it to them within four hours. So guess what they put in the same category as that? Your roster. 
So to the extent that you have a roster and a policy on this, that you are being asked for, um, you have to provide uh, those documents to OSHA within four hours, and then next day on everything else that's required. So make sure you've got these policies and procedures in place, and make sure that you uh, understand what OSHA is going to come and ask for so that you're ready uh, if they show up. And, you know, one of the things that we've been talking about with clients and, and in, amongst ourselves is manager training, because your managers are going to be the ones who are interfacing with the employees. I envision a scenario where an employee goes to a manager and says, are we really in compliance? Or I'm really concerned, or I don't feel safe, or I think we're not in compliance, and a manager blowing them off, and the employee feeling like the only place they can go is OSHA. So talking points, toolkits, manager training, helping your managers learn, know, and understand how to provide reassurance and good information to employees about all of your heavy lifting and efforts to be in compliance and provide a safe working environment, I think is a essential step in helping avoid what we anticipate to be a large influx of OSHA whistleblower complaints. So guys, have, have that plan, right? And in addition to helping your managers respond appropriately, you know, the big question here, and, and Marty, this is definitely something where I, I would love your perspective. I've got so many clients who have said, all right, I'm going to implement. This is a great opportunity for progressive discipline. You know, you show up without uploading your test results timely. That's infraction number one. You don't wear a mask. That's infraction number two. And each step of the way, we're going to write up that employee and have a regimented regular protocol that will lead to potentially termination. And while I think in theory that sounds fantastic, um, man, I rarely see clients that do a good job of consistently following progressive discipline steps. What have you been advising your clients? Yeah, I think you have to treat it almost like, you know, A, the rule requires us to send the employee home if they haven't been tested. So we know they have to go home. Uh, so it's sort of an unpaid suspension on its face. Mm -hmm. Fix it or else you're not getting paid. But pulling the trigger on termination, I like to think of this as sort of like an attendance issue. How would you handle it if they didn't show up and it was a no call, no show, or they were absent without excuse? Well, if you're going to give them three or four times before you're really going to start documenting and heading towards termination, I think that's what you have to do here too. The one caveat is if it creates a substantial safety issue, whatever they did. So, for example, they um, didn't get tested, came into the workplace and violated the masking policy and, you know, were breathing on doorknobs. I don't know. Um, something that created like a scene in the workplace and everybody was really uncomfortable. That's different. That's creating a, a potential safety issue. But to the extent it's just they didn't get tested that week, you send them home, write them up, ask them to get tested and move on. And if they do it again, maybe you take the next step in the progressive discipline policy. But it is not. Just like if somebody um, failed to come back from FMLA on time and they missed a day, it's not a fire them right away offense. It's something we've got to be really careful to document and handle like we would do anything else. All right. You want to, I guess the standard, Marty, would be you want to demonstrate to OSHA that you are taking this seriously you're making a sincere good faith effort. Is that the right standard to be in compliance and hold people accountable? Yep. Yeah. We just don't want to be uh, closing our eyes to it. Right? right. That would be a problem. So guys, we had mentioned before, there's a ton of resources on the OSHA landing page for COVID-19. And again, I've got to give a huge shout out to Fisher Phillips for the toolkit that they've created. They have certain processing criteria to receive that. Hub is developed an ebook and we continue to develop sister and brother documents or related documents to the ebook that we're posting out on our coronavirus resource center. I'm also sharing them on my LinkedIn page. But wait, yep, there's more. Don't go yet. Um, some of the unanswered questions. Marty, what do you think about all of the litigation that's going on? I know that is a huge question. Employers are trying to balance, you know, this is a huge heavy lift. What if the whole thing falls apart and I did all of this work? I keep flashing back to the DOL attempted change to the minimum salary and all the work employers did then. What are you thinking? 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really similar situation, but I think the employers that acted um, prior to the injunction on the overtime rule did the right thing. You can't wait till the 11th hour and then get caught unable to roll out policies in the appropriate time. So has it been challenged already? Yes. Has it been stayed already? Yes. So it was, uh, it was released on a Thursday, published on a Friday, stayed on a Saturday. So that's how quick that happened. Now, does stay mean injunction? And the answer is no. They're just staying enforcement of it right now. It is not enjoined nationwide. I read um, an industry group's update that said it was enjoined and cringed a little bit because it's not. Those mean different things. I know that is, you know, Carrie and I were talking about nerding out a little bit over some of this stuff. I know that's a very specific difference, but it's important to note that it's just stayed right now pending additional briefing. So what's going to happen? Well, this is multi-district litigation. We anticipate finding out uh, through a lottery system the federal government does which jurisdiction is supposed to. And I say supposed to because guess what? If you don't get the case, you might want to rule on your own case anyways. Um, but which district is supposed to hear the litigation? It will likely go through very expedited briefing. So we might see the Fifth Circuit try to do something in the interim. Um, we may see that. Keep in mind, in addition to that, we are likely to see a district court within, I would say, the end of, let's see, December 5th is a, a key date we've been talking about. I think we'll have a good idea of what the district court is going to do about it. District court is going to do about it by then. What is going to, or circuit, I keep saying district court, circuit court, it's a, the fifth circuit. It's not uh, like Northern District of Texas or anything. Um, Supreme Court's going to rule on this. That's what we all know. It's not going to sit around and be decided by a circuit court. So is that going to be decided by January 4th? That's the key question I keep getting from clients, and I can't give an answer. I just don't know. Even expedited briefing, that's a tight time frame. And let's play out the sequence of D.C. Circuit getting the case, D.C. Circuit saying we're going to uphold the ETS so it is enforceable, and then you're waiting for the Supreme Court to say yay or nay as to whether you have to follow. I really think you got to be ready on all of these components, ready to roll it out, you know, week before it's due on December, you know, so end of November. I think you have to be ready to roll. And Marty, is it fair to say that um, if OSHA is successful and they overcome all of the legal challenges and obstacles, there isn't going to be any kind of alteration to the deadline. So it'll go through the legal process, the Supreme Court will rule, and the deadlines are the deadlines. They're not going to say, okay, we know that you wanted to wait, so we'll move it, likely. Is that yeah, fair? Yeah, I mean, I think that's yeah, I think that's right. And even if you get a ruling against it, but then the ruling against it is overturned uh, and that it's found to be in place, there's a chance they say that's retroactive. Uh, there is precedent to do that. So it's messy. And the big takeaway for employers is don't sit around saying, well, this is going to get struck down anyways. We, we can't take that position because if it doesn't, you're really going to have the p potential for huge fines. And getting these vendors stood up, guys, getting the technology up and running, getting the policy in place, getting your roster together, gathering the documentation and the data, that is a heavy, heavy lift. And it is not something that you'll be able to turn around in a matter of days or even in a matter of a week or two. The vendors, as you can imagine, are swamped. The waiting lists are getting longer. It's getting harder to get demos. It's getting harder to get um, proposals back. So. This is time sensitive and I hate to add pressure during the holidays and on top of everything else we all have, but we would much rather get you ready now um, than help you clean up later. All right, so uh, we were, go ahead, Marty, I'm sorry. No, no, I don't care. Uh, <laughs> so there's a few other considerations we talked about. We're not gonna cover this in much detail today, but federal contractors, just keep in mind, this is for new contracts. This is not for, oh, your contract you signed as a federal contractor two years ago now is deemed to have this provision. That's not the way this all works. 
But if you want to continue being a federal contractor moving forward, that mandate is there. By the way, for people who are holding out hope that the federal mandate is going to be overturned, I think it's a much, much harder argument to overturn the federal mandate than it is the ETS. So be ready for that. And then, of course, CMS. Just know the scope is broad, but the regs limited it in some ways. Ask the questions. If you don't know if you're covered or not, reach out to me. Reach out to Carrie. Uh, we'll get you in touch with the right people. Thank you. All right. So, guys, I know everyone wants to talk about accommodations. Um, we are bumping up into time. I am well aware of that. We are going to go over, but I will do my best to make this efficient and consolidate our conversation. Um, keep in mind, as Marty talked about, this is a vaccine or test and face covering option. So if you have chosen not to implement a true mandate program, meaning vaccinate, accept, or say goodbye, and you have gone with the option program, which is vaccine, test, and face covering, when we talk about accommodations, while the writing is a little confusing, and Marty and I referenced this earlier, we believe the accommodation conversation happens at the face mask testing level, because the reality is, if you go with the vaccine test face covering option, you don't really care why an employee isn't getting vaccinated. What you care about is that the unvaccinated are testing and wearing face coverings. So if an employee raises their hand and says, I have an underlying health condition, I have a religious belief, or I am pregnant and I can't get tested and or can't wear masks, that's when you engage in the interactive process. Keep in mind Title VII and the ADA apply to employers of 15 or more employees. Certainly the ETS applies to employers of 100 or more. So everybody, y'all are all included. As we say in the South, y'all are all included um, in these obligations under both ADA and Title VII. When it comes to undue hardship, I've got a lot of clients who say, this is going to be disruptive to my business. I can't accommodate. I can't do these things. Undue hardship takes two different forms. I'm going to talk about Title VII, which is with respect to religion. Marty's going to talk about undue hardship under ADA two very, very different thresholds. An undue hardship under Title VII, I have a sincerely held religious belief, and as a result, I cannot wear a mask and or I cannot be tested. If the accommodation to the employee results in anything more than a de minimis cost, you may have an argument that it is an undue hardship. The EEOC gives us examples of regularly occurring overtime or having to hire new staff as examples of an undue hardship under Title VII. Compare that to ADA, which Marty's going to cover. Yeah, and it's just a much higher standard. So it's not de minimis cost. This is a substantial cost to the employer. You need to find out, you know, maybe their request is unreasonable, but what I like to tell employers about the ADA is, you're not obligated to give the employee their requested accommodation, which might be unreasonable. You're required to give them a reasonable accommodation, but that's the accommodation. That's not the hardship. The hardship is something that we are literally saying, how much is this going to cost you? And it has to be a substantial situation. So you have to be able to demonstrate it. You need to be able to document it and you have to be able to prove it to a court. And that's the situation where, hey, I can't do this because my doctor says I can't do this, right? This is the ADA situation. We've been dealing with masking issues under the ADA for months now. This isn't new. Um, we haven't been dealing with testing issues under the ADA. But I really can't come up with a good argument if I can't take a test because of my disability. I think you will see the masking arguments. And you've just got to engage in the interactive process because I think the undue hardship argument is going to be tough. And as a side note, and, and Marty and I spoke about this earlier, I, I recently learned that there is a saliva-based COVID test where they don't have to stick the swab up your nose. So in the event that somebody has some kind of obstruction, there is saliva testing. And so maybe as you search for your testing vendors, that's one of the questions that you ask. And that could solve for somebody who has some kind of 
nasal problem that would interfere with their ability to use the swab. Um, but all mm -hmm. of this comes down to the interactive process. Marty, you live and breathe this on a regular basis. <laughs> <laughs> What what, yeah. what guidance? What suggestions do you have for our for our attendees today? Document, document, document. Uh, I mean, the interactive process is the hardest thing about this. Is people like to say, "Well, we talked on the phone, and here's what we decided." And guess what? When you get sued a year later, you cannot have any recollection of what happened. Plus, it's a they said versus I said situation. So. Start by finding out the supervisor needs to be trained and understand what an accommodation request is. They're going to report it to the human resources office. And at that point, you're going to start engaging in the interactive process in a documented fashion where you're writing down what they ask for, you're writing down what you request, you're picking the option that makes the most sense, and then you're going to implement it. And guys, I want to warn you or, or suggest that you proceed with caution. There are solutions coming out like crazy. They're technology-based solutions that automate the interactive process, which is really in my mind an oxymoron because if you look at what the EEOC says and you look at the case law around the interactive process, it requires an individualized assessment of the specific facts and circumstances associated with the individual employee. And I'm just not sure how a technology system can automate an individualized specific fact and circumstance assessment of each individual request. All right, so some examples. Um, to Marty's point, boy, we have been dealing with, with face covering and mask issues for, I guess we're going into 18 months now since, since we started seeing mask mandates pop up across the country and then federally. So what are the, some of the things that you can do? Well, we already saw that one of the exceptions to face coverings is put somebody in a room with floor to ceiling walls and a door, otherwise known as an office. Um, so putting them in an office may be may work. Um, additional barriers around the workspace, I don't know that that's going to work, Marty. What do you think, as opposed to putting them in an office, given the specific guidance in the ETS? Yeah, uh, certainly not from an ETS perspective, unless it's floor, yeah, you can, it's floor to ceiling with a door. So uh, that's a pretty specific definition of what an office is. Yeah, agreed. Um, job restructuring, can they perform the work remotely? Can they perform the work entirely outside? Can you restructure the position and the employee in a way to fit into some of these exceptions? Um, if there is no accommodation, then they're going to have to go home on unpaid leave until the ETS is over or until they're able to um, wear a face covering and be tested regularly. A word of warning, we've been talking about this for Two years now, remember that there are limitations on the kind of medical information you're allowed to have about your employees and when you're allowed to have it. One of the big questions I'm getting is, can I ask my candidates if they're vaccinated? And if it's before the offer, no, you cannot. You cannot ask them any questions about whether or not about their health condition before any offer of employment. You can tell them your rules, you can give them a copy of your policy, but you can't ask. After the offer and before the date of hire, yes, you can ask. They can get physical exams. They can get their COVID tests. Um, a lot of the construction industry is really comfortable with this process because this is the time when they go for their physical before they start working. And then after the date of hire, remember, even with COVID, there are still limits on what you're allowed to know, and it's all confidential and must be kept separately. Marty, you want to talk real quickly about Gina as we get to the end here? Sure, just remember uh, GINA Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act is out there. Don't ask about things that might provide genetic information. And a lot of people don't think about this, but there are a lot of questions you could ask that have medical history that may provide genetic information. Uh, remember, it's not just them, but it's also about family medical conditions. Um, so think about those who uh, are their dependents, family members, and then of course down here, I won't read to you the list of family member uh, degrees, but it gives you a good idea of the types of things we don't want to ask them about, you know, hey, is there a family history of this? Great. 
And then I think, you know, we've all been talking about pandemic plans for, for a year and a half, two years now. Um, so don't give up on your pandemic plan. Don't walk away from your safety protocols. Marty, what are you sharing with your clients? Yeah, this is now we're saying this is part of your pandemic plan. And you can put that date in there and say our pandemic plan is adjusted on these dates, um, the period of the ETS to include this. Uh, but I think not only do you not want to forget about it, but I think you actually want to update it to include your ETS policies and procedures. I agree. And we are telling our clients to continue doing your medical screening every day, vaccinated, unvaccinated, who's ever coming in. You don't want anybody coming in who has symptoms of COVID. Um, all right, guys, join us on Friday, November 19th at 12 p.m. Central. We're going to do this again and take all of your questions. On behalf of Fisher Phillips and Hub, thank you so much for attending today. Um, continuing education information will be sent to you in the follow-up email. A link to this riveting conversation today will also be sent to you in a follow-up email. And again, please fill out the survey. We really value your feedback. Have a good rest of your day. Thanks so much for attending.